We're going to look at Zynga now using the website app Stock Glasses. This is a request from Mr. Chocolate, so thank you for the recommendation. And let's dive right in and see what we can find. Zynga is a mobile gaming company, and as you can see, their price is doing pretty well compared to other companies right now because they are uh, producing things that people can use to entertain themselves while they're stuck indoors and in quarantine and not able to go out. So we, we should probably not be surprised that their price is not very badly beaten down. People expect them to do well because people are bored and need to find things to do to occupy themselves. And so they're going to probably go look for online games, such as the ones that Zynga creates. Their free cash flow for the most recent quarter is $89 million. Good positive number. Net income for the most recent quarter is negative $3.5 million, which is not what we want to see. Their current assets to debt and total assets to debt are generally good numbers. Remember, you can get an explanation of these metrics if you hover over the question mark on the app and you can see what some of these things mean and what numbers to look for. So we can expect to see a healthy balance sheet. Let's go into more details. Revenue looks good, continually climbing. Net income looks pretty good, on an upwards trend, mostly positive. Free cash flow looks healthy as well and is continually growing. So these are sort of good numbers that you want to see. Their website is right here, and I've gone there to the Investor Relations section and read the latest 10K annual report, uh, specifically the section on management's review of operations for the fiscal year. So we're going to go over those notes, but first let's quickly look at the valuation ratios. Price to earnings is very high uh, because people, I guess, think that they're going to do really well. Considering the pandemic situation, uh, price to book is over the sector average. Same thing with price to sales and price to cash flow. Remember, these are just starting points. The real meat and potatoes of your investigation needs to be reading through the SEC filings and looking at management, their products, and customer sentiment, etc. Balance sheet, as we suspected, looks pretty healthy. $1.5 billion over $792 million current debt. Their assets, uh, total assets, $3.6 billion over $1.8 billion, so, almost, so basically two times their total debt. This is what we want to see during this pandemic situation. We want to find companies with a strong balance sheet because the economy is taking a bad hit and companies are going to need to survive through this. And in order to do that, they're going to have to have cash on hand and assets to cover their obligations so that they don't go bankrupt and can weather the storm. So this is looking pretty good in that regard. Their operating cash flow is 94 million, nice healthy positive number. CapEx is a nice low number compared to their operating cash flow. So at the end of the day, their free cash flow, which is money we can put in our pocket as business owners, theoretically, is 89.2 million, a nice positive healthy number. Now their business develops games for the Apple iOS system, Android, and other online platforms such as Facebook. They're mostly developing mobile games right now. They used to do, I think, more website games. Uh, one of their popular website games that you can find on Facebook is Farmville. I'm sure if you've used Facebook, you've seen this game. It's very popular. But most of their games now are on the Apple Store and Google Play Store. That's where you can find them, and that's where they're focusing their attention now. Their business model is around social games that are designed that as more players play the games, social interactions increase, and the more valuable our games and our business become. So there's an emphasis on attracting players that are interested in socially interacting with other players online through these games. They are an innovator of social games and a leader in, the play, in making play a core activity. And the objective is to become the worldwide leader in play by connecting the world through games. Now, they have approximately 69 million average monthly users in 2019, but they note in their annual report that we need to take these metrics with a bit of a grain of salt because the way that they measure them is such that they're not entirely sure how accurate they are. And they're very transparent about this. Um, they had problems measuring these metrics when they were in the website, more in the website domain, because it is, I guess, easier for users to make a replicate, replicate users, and um, it's just more difficult to measure the metrics for whatever various reasons. Now, apparently, it's noted that it's easier to measure the metrics of the users in the mobile world, 
but they still note that these numbers may not be entirely accurate. So that's just something we need to keep in mind. Their revenue, uh, their business model is basically their, their games are free to play, and we most of us have probably seen this if we've played mobile online games. The games are free to play, you download them, install them, and then there are in-game purchases that you can uh, participate in to either make the game more fun or give yourself a competitive advantage over other players in the game. Same model that they're using here. And they also have, of course, advertising revenue. Now, one thing that surprised me is that they, they note that the revenue from in-game purchases, which they call virtual items, is, is actually makes a, a low percentage of the users purchase virtual items. And so I suspected that most of their revenue would be made from advertising. It turns out that's not the case. It turns out that 20% of their revenue is advertising and 79% of their total revenue comes from virtual items, which are in-game purchases. This sort of surprised me. It was a bit of a head scratcher, um, but uh, apparently, even though a small percentage of their users purchase make in-game purchases, it does. Uh, it's enough to account for most of their revenue, which uh, was very healthy this year. And we'll see a little bit why that was a little later on here. They have top three games this year, and uh, the uh, top three games generate. Um, a lot of their income, uh, they contribute historically to their income significantly. And another thing to note is that the top three games, uh, assuming there are three all the time, change uh, from time to time. So these are the top three games this year, but what were the top three games last year? Or what are the top three games going to be next year? They note that these change. Uh, but for this year, it's Merge Dragons, Empires and Puzzles, and Zynga Poker. So right off the bat, my first concern would be, are they going to be able to rely on revenue, not only from these games, but assuming that these games, even though they were hits this year, uh, they may not be next year. So are they going to put out other hits that are going to generate the same amount of revenue that these did? How do they know that they're going to be as successful as these games were? Uh, for instance, Zynga Poker was a big hit in 2018, but in 2019, even though it was still one of the top three games, they do note that revenues have declined for this game and it seems to be becoming less popular. Yeah, another interesting thing to note about their casino games is that users don't actually play with real money. Uh, it's fake play money. Um, I can't remember if they actually do buy chips to play the games, but uh, it's not a conventional casino a gambling game. Uh, it's just something interesting I, I noted about it. But in any case, uh, we can't rely on these games to continue producing the revenues that they've had. It seems like uh, it, they, some of the games are, are kind of, they kind of act like fads that go in and out of style. People play them, they like them for a while, and then get tired of them and move on to something else. Now, the uh, virtual items, as we already looked at, make up most of their revenue. Um, the international revenue is 37% of their total revenue, so they do have international presence. This year, or in 2019 rather, they had the best performance in their history with a revenue of 1.2 to 1.3 billion. Uh, this is very good news and um, this is what we want to see. However, as we continue to invest, investigate this company, the question will arise if, if this is going to continue to happen and they're going to continue to grow. So let's keep going here. They made an acquisition of Small Giant Games. This is important because it is it was the owner of one of their top three games, which is a main driver of their revenue and was in 2019, which is Empires and Puzzles. So that means that they are making these acquisitions of these companies, other mobile gaming companies, that have these games that could potentially be hits, and in this case, it worked. So they made an acquisition, and one of the games that the company owned was one of their top three grossing games. So my big question is, is are they going to be able to keep doing this, and if they make future acquisitions, how can they be sure that the games that the company own are going to be hits like this and generate the revenue? The reason that that this is really important is because they incurred significant costs from making this acquisition. And we're going to see that more as we look at the risks section. 
Uh, there was a 46% increase in revenue from 2019 to 2018. That's a nice, healthy increase. 2017 to 2018 growth was much lower, though, at 5%. So we can't say that this 46% is going to continue to happen or has consistently happened in the past. There could be cyclical things at work here. I haven't checked the history beyond 2017, but that is one of the things we would want to do if looking further into this company is continue looking into their history and seeing, okay, well, does this increase of 46% occur in the past or in aggregate? Does the growth rate, when you're looking at a greater number of years, add up to you know a satisfactory growth rate for you, like at least 10% or more, let's say? That would be something else we would have to look into, but something to take note just looking at these years in any case. The cost of revenue, this is a, one of my main concerns about this company is that their costs seem very high and what it seems like is that they just kind of keep breaking even year after year, at least from 2017 to 2019. And part of the reason is, is because as we saw before, they make these acquisitions of these companies that, you know, in this case, okay, they do have a game that turned out to be a hit in one of their top three games. But at the same time, if that didn't happen and they didn't make the right call, then they would have incurred these large costs and they would have had these assets that did not generate a return uh, that is, um, you know, comparable to the cost that they paid or worth the cost that they paid. So their cost of revenue is big, $524 million. Increased 72% since 2018. Research and development increased 87% since 2018. Sales and marketing increased 105% from 2018. This is really high increase in costs from their previous year. And so that sort of raises my eyebrows like, okay, they're making more revenue, but if they're going to be increasing their costs at these rates, then it's all moot. It's just going to, it's going to offset the revenue that they make. Now the argument could be made that they're investing in their business. And some of this could be looked at like that so that uh, and, and that's generally sort of what you want to see too especially with growth companies is that they're taking the, the revenue and reinvesting it to grow their business um, however looking at at least 2017 to 2019 i mean it, all of the years looked absolutely identical their their costs increased they either equaled the revenue that they brought in or exceeded the revenue that they brought in. It just doesn't seem like they're making any headway in this game as far as I can see. And so that's something that sort of uh, turned me off from the company a little bit, looking at that and seeing that. Now most of the significant costs were related to the acquisitions. Uh, and again, one of my main concerns is what if one of the acquisitions they make is a flop? Well now this large cost increase that is going to have to be offset by revenue that would be generated by this acquisition, if that doesn't happen, then all they have is the large cost increase without the increase in revenue. And that's going to hit them pretty hard, I would think. So looking at the risks, uh, we already went over that the method of tracking users may not be total, totally accurate. It's a minor risk. We, we just have to keep that in mind. Uh, they're dependent on the Apple App Store and Google Play platforms, as most of their users come from those. So if they increase their fees, Google or Apple, or they make it more difficult to put their games up on their platforms, or they change the policies, um, then they could be in trouble in that way because they're depending on those platforms to get their products out to users. Uh, generally, Generally, I don't like to see that when companies are dependent on third parties uh, for their success. But um, maybe it's not as big of a risk right now since Apple and Google maybe want their games on their platforms because they're so popular and people like them. Um, moving on, top revenue grossing games can decline in popularity as we already discussed. Uh, just seems like a grind of a business model. You have to just keep coming up with new hits over and over again. Are you going to be able to do that? Uh, it's just something that, in my opinion, is not easy to predict. And ideally, you want to find businesses that have a business model where their success is easier to predict. So you have higher odds of making a good bet on them. Expensive acquisition of companies uh, that do not generate or deliver a good return on revenues. Uh, there's past positive cash flow this year, 
Um, but uh, will there be positive cash flow from these acquisitions in the future? As we've already noted, costs are very high, as we already noted as well. What are their tailwinds? Good cash flow and revenues allow them to acquire other gaming companies that are producing and contributing to significant revenue increases. Wash, rinse, and repeat. If they can do that, then that actually is a great business model. The question, of course, arises is how long can they keep that game up, given that some of these acquisitions may not produce the hits that generate the revenue that, for instance, the small giant did in 2019. They expect to finance their operations through operating cash flows and cash on hand. They have a healthy balance sheet, so they're probably not going to dilute the stock. They're probably not going to go more into debt. Uh, currently, this seems feasible with their good cash flows and revenues, and note that I emphasize currently this could change in the future. But in the meantime, they are in a good position to finance their operations without having to go into debt or dilute the stock. Balance sheet is good. So let's look at the key positives and negatives. They're using cash flows and revenue to acquire other companies that generate more cash flows and revenue. It's a double-edged sword, but generally this is a great way to grow a business. You acquire other companies that generate cash, which then you can then use to acquire other companies, and you just keep repeating this cycle, and you can grow expo exponentially that way. However, the business model requires constant innovation to generate hits caref and careful, strategic, potentially risky acquisitions to fill that role. Uh, as we've already discussed, we can't be sure that these acquisitions are going to produce the return on investment consistently, as they did in 2019, for instance. They have high costs that equal or exceed their revenue consistently. You know, I would prefer to see a history of revenue that is growing at a higher rate than costs, as opposed to revenue that is barely keeping up with the cost increases. Uh, argument could be made, of course, that in a growth stock, maybe this isn't as, as big of a red flag. But for me personally, I'm looking for companies that uh, are, are have their head way above water as opposed to barely keeping it above the water, which it appears that this company is doing right now. Uh, so overall, uh, it is a cool company. They make good games. People love their games, and a lot of people play them. So it's a good company, and, and, and it's, um, um, it's not bad. It's just that, uh, in my opinion, I think there are other better opportunities out there, and um, I think I'm probably going to try to look for other other companies. Um, but I do appreciate the recommendation to look at this and uh, it was very interesting to look into. Um, I hope you found it interesting as well. Um, if you have uh, reasons that you think this company is going to be a big hit and do great, put them in the comments and let's talk about it some more. Otherwise, I hope you enjoyed the video and see you in the next one.